Good evening, everyone. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is a nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books, and Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We're really excited to be here with all of you virtually tonight to celebrate the book birthday of medical gaslighting, how to get the care you deserve in a system that makes you fight for your life. This is a really important new book by Alana Jacqueline, and she is here. She's the author, um, and we're joined by two medical professionals as well to kind of help us round out this important conversation. Um, and those doctors are Dr. Janaya Cald Calderia and Dr. Alopi Patel. Um, they are going to share their experiences, and um, we're going to hear a lot from Alana about what it was like to write this book, her own experiences as a patient. And my favorite line from the copy of um, this book is, you might have to get naked in the exam room, but you don't have to walk in unarmed. Uh, I think that's a great um, summation of this book. And this is such an important tool for so many of us who deal with chronic illness, chronic pain, um, disability, anything where we are um, not respected when we go into the doctor's office. So I'm gonna introduce uh, Alana first. Alana Jacqueline is a speaker, author, patient, and advocacy strategist whose journey to a rare disease diagnosis forced her to face a lifetime of medical gaslighting. While her personal experience as a patient has lent her compassion for what all women are subject to in the exam room, it is her experience as a patient advocate that opened her eyes to the reality that no matter how rare or common the condition may be, it often takes women longer to be heard by the medical community. She's the author of Surviving and Thriving with an Invisible Chronic Illness and an educator for patients at all stages of their journey on how to have meaningful and collaborative conversations with their care teams. Her work across social media, particularly in the area of medical gaslighting, has helped to empower patients to be an active participant in their own care. And again, she's joined by Janaya Calderia, who, who is a DO. She's a board certified physician who after many years of clinical practice decided to dedicate her time to education and advocacy full time. As of today, I think you said, uh, you're, you're beginning a, a new journey. Um, Dr. Calderia, provides preventative care and treatment of acute and chronic diseases and injuries for people of all ages. And she's going to share more about her new practice and her, her new journey with us. And Dr. Alopi M. Patel is a double board certified anesthesiologist and interventional pain physician. She attended New Jersey Medical School at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. She specializes in treating male and female pelvic pain. She's also certified in lifestyle medicine by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. She's an accomplished women's health advocate known for her contributions, not only in patient advocacy, but also supporting women in the workplace. And I've dropped everyone's full bios in the chat a little bit higher up. So please do read their entire bios. These are very accomplished folks. And uh, I always want to give people their due. Um, but we want to make sure we have time for the full conversation. So I'm going to kick it over to Alana and then we will um, get right into this conversation. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, ER, and thank you both for joining me. We were having a really good conversation before everyone came in, so we'll get back to that in a minute. Um, you're, you missed out, but don't worry, we'll get back to it. Um, I wanted to deliver a few thank yous before we start tonight. Uh, first, I'd like to thank my team at Ben Bella Books, uh, Leah, my fantastic editor, Heather, who has been losing sleep, no doubt, uh, these final few weeks to get me on every podcast and publication we can think of, and my agent, Jill, for helping me to find this manuscript, the perfect home, and I truly believe that um, that having it at Ben Bella was the perfect home for it. I also want to thank Karis for having me here today. Um, I am really honored to be hosted by Karis and encourage all of you to check out their site if you're not in town. Um, and if you happen to be in Georgia uh, for a visit, please stop by and go support the amazing work that they do. Now, later this session, we'll be interviewing my two expert sources from this book, Dr. Janaya Kataria and Dr. Alopi Patel. And I will also be taking questions myself if you'd like to leave them in the chat. And I wanted to start this off really optimistically by saying that I don't know about you, but a lot of my friends are dead. Um, them's the breaks when you, like your community, outlive a chronic illness that probably should have killed you 10 times over. And I'm not saying that the death of my friends were all preventable, but I know that many of them throughout the course of their lives, even those with very well-documented diseases, 
encountered numerous instances of a topic that we're going to explore tonight called medical gaslighting. Medical gaslighting is the act of a healthcare provider dismissing or ignoring a patient's concerns or complaints and leaving them without a clear treatment plan or diagnosis, often stating that the patient has an unspecified mental illness or is exhibiting an unnecessary amount of caution. So are you sick? No, you're not. You're hysterical. You're overwhelmed. You're overreacting. You're bored. You're sad. You're attention seeking. You're anxious. You're trying to get out of school or work. You possess a vagina, etc. By the end of this night or the end of your journey with this book, you'll probably realize that at some point in your life, you've experienced medical gaslighting. And you didn't know it at the time because the phrase was unfamiliar. And if it was familiar, it was undefined. And if it was undefined, you probably found a way to gaslight yourself out of thinking that it even happened. But the reality is that patients, primarily women, go to the doctor every day and from painful periods to burst appendixes to lumps in their breasts, they are finessed into silence, duped into obedience and scammed out of the quality or duration of life that they deserve. Now, I'm a rare disease patient and a patient advocate and nearly every woman woman that I have ever interviewed in my 15 years of patient advocacy has had an experience where they've had their concerns dismissed. But it's not always so easy to recognize. Medical gaslighting isn't always having a doctor yell at you or kick you out of the practice. It isn't always being insulted or turned away. It isn't always being yelled at. Sometimes it comes to you kindly and compassionately, but whether the tone of the provider is kind or cruel, it still separates you from the thing that you actually need most, which is evidence-based care. And you deserve that. This book has been a very long time coming. Uh, it was built on the raw honesty of not just patients, but physicians, experts, government officials, and the cumulative research produced by many, many women before me. And the most important thing to me, when my editor, Leah, and the team at Ben Bella asked, you know, what is your goal with this book? It was to get it into the hands of as many women as possible. I wanted it accessible in every format, in a way that was as entertaining as it was informative. A beach read about women's health is what I told them. I didn't want it to sound academic. I didn't want you to have to be a voracious reader to pick it up, accessible to every woman, because this is a collection of the most familiar secrets in the history of womanhood. These secrets are the kind that we sneak into our older sister's bed at night and ask her what to do about them. The kind of secrets we post about under false names and Facebook groups the kind of secrets we experience and cry about in our car outside the doctor's office, the universal experience of profound shame in rooms where our confidence and self-empowerment is most needed. Because unlike locker rooms and hair salons and wine nights with our best friends and in break rooms with our most loyal coworkers, in these exam rooms where we face what should always be our allies with stethoscopes, in these rooms, we face the understanding that our lives are truly at risk. There are two parts of this book. The first is about defining this invisible enemy of medical gaslighting. What is it? What causes it? What does it look like? What happens to us because of it? And the second half is how hard am I going to have to fight to stop it from happening to me? In this book, you'll hear patient stories from a variety of women who are very much just like you, smart, brave, self-aware, and maybe for some of you, or a lot of you, chronically or even complexly ill. And they are young and old, black and white and Latina, and they are just people, people put in situations where the healthcare system was supposed to support and heal them and instead failed and wounded them. These are very, very vulnerable stories that I have carried with me since the day they were entrusted to me. And to put them out in the world, which gives me so much anxiety, but it also is to hope that they will be treated with the same respect and reverence that they deserve when they are freely given 
as a cautionary tale outside of therapist offices and the closest of confidants. So I want to read to you a few pages of medical gaslighting. And ER mentioned it before, but here we go. We're going to start with it. You might have to get naked in the exam room, but you don't have to walk in unarmed. Long gone are the days of being dragged into the doctor's office by your mother's hand with the promise of candy if you agreed to behave like a brave little girl. The times when someone older and wiser would be your advocate in these rooms. Today, with your legs hanging over the table's edge, the stress sweat gluing your thigh to the paper sheet underneath you, you're on your own. When I think about all the moments in my life when I have been wrapped up in paper gowns with my feet hitched into stirrups, following the directions of people who I thought by law, by oath, and by trade were supposed to protect me at all costs, all I can think is, who was that girl? How was she so blissfully unafraid? At what point did she come to her senses? When did she finally realize that letting down her guard at her most physically vulnerable was the very last thing she was supposed to do? And why, in her many years of medical mishaps, did no one warn her? Why did no one make it clear that she could not be heard over the swirl of bias in those rooms based on her age, her body language, her tax bracket, her accent, her clothes, her hair color, and the number of holes between her legs. If I could go back in time, if I could tell her what I know now, the reunion would not be sweet and it would not be calm. I would have grabbed her face, looked her in the eyes, and told her to wake up because no one else was coming to save her. This book is not about coming to peace with your disease. It is not about learning to be softer, or how time heals all wounds. It is about recognizing that getting access to the care you deserve means learning to fight for it. You will have to surrender the idea that someone is coming to save you. You will have to learn strategies to take what you need, defend your quality of life, and destroy that voice inside you that wonders, am I worth all the struggle? This book is a warning and a call to action. If you are born a woman in America, the healthcare system was not built to give you quality of life. It may keep you alive, it may keep you sedated, but if you want to be heard in that exam room, you need to arm yourself with tools, the rules, and the understanding that the second you come through those doors, you are fighting for your life. If you know me from my previous book, Surviving and Thriving with an Invisible Chronic Illness, you'll know I did just that. I survived 19 years of my life with an invisible, undiagnosed disease before finally being diagnosed in 2009 with a rare immune deficiency disease called hypogamma globulin anemia. I'm not gonna be mad if anybody read that and just skipped over it in their brain because wow, it's hard to pronounce. Had I been diagnosed at birth and given the available treatments for my disease since then, my entire life would have been different. I would have grown up relatively healthy, I would have not developed infections that led to organ damage and sepsis. I would have not undergone countless hospitalizations or been subject to hundreds of scenarios in which doctors of all backgrounds in all specialties looked me up and down and said, you look fine. Your tests are all coming back normal. This must be all in your head. It should be noted that despite my gender, I had every possible privilege a patient could have in the United States. I was white, I always had insurance, I had caring, well-educated parents, I lived in nice houses and went to private schools, I was not diagnosed with any severe mental illness, I could communicate relatively well, even at a young age, and I wasn't shy. I wasn't embarrassed to tell doctors all my most gruesome symptoms in excruciating detail. After all, I was a writer at heart and could really do justice to the description of an infection. Despite all of that, I was just as susceptible as anyone else to getting sick, staying sick, and having my illness dismissed. Maybe it was just my age. Minors and their caregivers are more susceptible to medical gaslighting because society paints minors as unable to accurately self-describe illness and having ulterior motives like getting out of school or chores. So I did my research and continued to age. This did not improve my situation. 
I continued my search, was eventually diagnosed, and at long last had that elusive blood test com confirmation in my medical records. Still, it felt as if doctors did not see me as a reliable narrator. Today, I'm surviving, I'm thriving, I'm working full time, I'm in excruciating pain, I'm married, my organs are literally rotting inside me, I am working a corporate job, I'm vomiting into my trash bin before I hop on Zoom calls, I'm really living the American dream. But every time I encounter a new physician unfamiliar with my case, I hear the same things. You're probably working too much and that's why you're sick. You are too fat and that's why you're sick. You're too thin and that's why you're sick. You can't possibly know something is wrong just because you feel like there is. You can't differentiate between severe pain and chronic pain. You need to drink more water. You need to eat more fiber. You need to go to pain management. You can't expect pain management to magically take care of all your pain. You are working out too much. You are not working out enough. That's probably just a side effect of your medication. Basically, I've been told I cannot be trusted to report malfunctions in my body no matter how obvious they are, no matter how many times they have occurred in just the same way with just the same triggers. And for the longest time, quite literally for the life of me, I could not figure out why, but I learned. And I'm gonna tell you about every single way I screwed it up because I did screw it up so bad. I absolutely ate shit in ways I now understand to be obvious, but at the time seemed perfectly innocent and totally inconsequential. From the words I used, to the way I dressed, to the doctors I continued seeing far past the point when I knew they were never going to hear me, I put myself in situations that were avoidable. I knew the system was broken, and yet I went forth as though I was somehow going to be different and seen. Much like me, the women I interviewed for this book had no idea about the silent dangers of medical gaslighting, how the words they were using, the treatments and diagnoses they were agreeing to, and the people they put their trust in were leading them off cliffs they didn't know existed. Many of them wondered what might have been if they'd had someone out there to warn them, to guide them, and to caution them. They wondered, could they be that person now? If they shared these vulnerable moments, would it stop history from repeating? Self-advocacy is not always glamorous. It is not bursting into the room with spike heels and big demands or slamming down a medical textbook on a hospital bedside table. Sometimes it is the strategic way we tell our story, the quiet smothering of our rage to gain someone's trust or favor, the phrasing of innocent questions so that they leave no room for argument. I am a feminist, but whatever version of feminism you might think you need to live up to when it comes to your health, let go of it. Because this book is not a feminist manifesto. This book is about surviving. There is a time and a place for being a woman of individuality and character. I hope this book gives you all the tools you need to survive long enough to be that woman. Because women who make their mark on the world can't get started from the grave. As women, we're taught more or less about our periods, the care and keeping of our bodies through puberty and menopause, what it will feel like when we labor, why we check our breasts for lumps, and how to be mindful and quiet. Be alert, they tell us, when we walk down dark alleyways. Be vigilant, they remind us, as we create joint bank accounts. But nobody warns women that the most vulnerable role they will find themselves playing is one of a patient. Nobody gives us the hard truth on why women's pain is ignored, why women die in childbirth, why women are diagnosed later than men for the same conditions, if at all. If you are a woman with cancer or another long-term chronic illness, a health crisis, or a caregiver for someone who fits this description, this is the essential guide for defending against a medical and societal system that was not built to bear the burden of women who want to be well. You might recognize medical gaslighting by the following phrases. This is all in your head. It's probably just stress. I think you need a vacation or a glass of wine. If you just thought more positively, you wouldn't focus so much on your symptoms. Getting any of these comments about your health during a doctor's appointment that you scheduled, waited for, and paid for because you had a concern that needed a resolution 
can range from frustrating to absolutely devastating. So what is the intention of medically gaslighting a patient? What is it done in the effort of accomplishing? To many doctors, they might say they use these phrases in an effort to alleviate your stress or anxiety about your health. But the reality of why women are actually gaslit about their bodies comes from a variety of factors, including implicit and unconscious bias, the ease by which we are allowed to gaslight women under the patient-physician power imbalance, an overburdened medical system, a lack of understanding of not just the human body, but in particular, the female body, as well as a long and sordid history of encouraging the myth of hysteria. The consequences are that patients feel too ashamed to continue seeking care. This leads to delayed diagnosis or disease progression. If a child inherits a disease from their parent that the parent was shamed out of seeking care for, they also inadvertently shame the child out of seeking care. And if a patient is given a diagnosis of exclusion or a diagnosis that has no testable criteria and is based on the doctor running out of answers for what specifically ails that patient, then the data pool for that diagnosis be it something like conversion disorder or chronic fatigue, can be polluted by patients who aren't actually getting the workup they need to have lookalike conditions ruled out. Essentially, it screws a lot of shit up. If you give a patient a half-assed diagnosis, sometimes the patient dies of it. In an effort to make sure we all survive the perils of our local emergency rooms and doctor's offices, I relied on some experts who had the inside scoop. I'm so, so excited to have, as mentioned, two experts from this book with us tonight. Dr. Janaya Kataria, who is a board certified family physician with over 24 years of experience, who shifted her clinical practice into advocacy and now takes on assisting patients through navigating their healthcare journeys. And Dr. Alobi Patel, a double board certified anesthesiologist and interventional pain physician who focuses on female pelvic pain, thank God, because who else is doing that? and is the co-host of the Hurt podcast by the Female Pain Docs. Both are fortunate enough to have seen both sides of the equation, what the appointment is like as a female patient and what the appointment is like as a physician. Their expertise was integral to helping me gain an understanding as to how the minds of doctors work and what they are being trained to do and how we can encourage not just patients to fight back against medical gaslighting, but doctors and how they can recognize and reject the kind of education that helps to create a power imbalance instead of a collaborative relationship. And if we wanna bring both of them back on screen now, we'll, we'll ask them some questions. Hey, all right, thank you both for joining me here tonight and also for being such great resources for me as I worked through this manuscript. I know I had so many questions. <laughs> that you guys were wonderful in answering and helping with. I think it would be helpful to understand why medical gaslighting is a topic that has become something important for you to speak out on personally and professionally. And I'll start with you, Dr. Patel. Why take on medical gaslighting in your advocacy and your practice? Well, thank you, Alana, for including me in the book and the journey because I I personally didn't know what medical gaslighting was until just a few years ago. And it was something that I think the word gaslighting had just kind of become popular on social media. And I realized that this actually happens to patients in the healthcare system. It happens to me as a patient in the healthcare system in the sense that our pain or our symptoms are not taken as, as seriously. So what, what encouraged me to take it on was basically as a physician, I realized I had that privilege that opportunity to create a change in a different manner than the traditional sense of, of giving, um, you know, medical care to a patient. So it improves patient outcomes. It really helps with the health inequities. We know that there are so many gender inequities in, in medicine in general, um, and it helps increase the medical knowledge. I think a big part of patient care is education and giving that, that education and advocacy to that patient can make a big difference. So personally, as a woman who has been a patient myself and as a physician who has seen many women in my practice, um, especially because I focus on pelvic pain, I see a lot of women who have been unfortunately gaslit for several years, if not decades by the time uh, we actually see them and are able to give them care. It empowered me to really advocate for my patients and make a difference. That's amazing. And I think that 
is really a sigh of relief to to all of us here tonight just to know that we can see that there's a problem and we can know that there's a way to fix it and there's a way to educate and kind of not have to not have to blame you know ourselves or what we've been taught but really question it and and figure out what to do about it next um dr cotteria what about you why tackle medical gaslighting Thank you. Yes, I'm so happy to be here to be talking about this. Um, personally, I have been on the receiving end of medical gaslighting and medical trauma. Um, this has affected me and my family in such a profound way that it shaped my entire foundation of the type of doctor I wanted to be. I, throughout my medical training and in practice, it became very apparent that this was actually a widespread problem. It wasn't just me, it wasn't just my family, it wasn't just my community, it's happening everywhere. And when I started witnessing it happening to my patients over and over again, it deeply, deeply personally affected me because I know exactly how it feels. And this is what's made me take on this issue on the professional level. I feel like that must be really hard to, to have had it happen to you, to see it happen professionally, just to walk into work every day with that pain, knowing that this is something that your patients have gone through and and now you are <laughs> you are their next and only option. Um and and the 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 kind of trust and concern that you must go into work every day with to to help them through that. And during our initial interview, Dr. Carteria, we talk about how the provider can discourage colleagues from gaslighting vulnerable patients. Can you tell us a little bit about how you go about doing that? <laughs> I'm a little sneaky about it, but um, <laughs> you know, uh, there, there's a lot of we we're not holding each other accountable. We we're, and there's a lot of we. It's it's hard um, mm -hmm. in primary care and in many insurance networks and healthcare delivery systems. The primary care physician or provider is the gateway to the specialist. So if patients are consistently coming back to me telling me these horrid experiences, I just stop referring to that doctor. You know, unfortunately, healthcare is a business, and many healthcare systems rely on the referrals from the primary care for their business. And so, not only do I stop referring to these doctors who have repeated complaints, I would also actually document on the referral, uh, referral to neurology, everybody except Dr. Gaslight. And I would just leave it at that. And a lot of people see the referral. A lot of people see my documentation, you know, the insurance, the, the office staff, the specialist, the referrals department. And, you know, if you want to be extra sassy, you can put, please do not refer to Dr. So-and-so due to several complaints and leave it at that. It's quick, it's simple, and it sends a message. And a lot of people see it. Oh my God. That reminds me so much of, so in this book, we have a chapter about your electronic medical record and it is your, your secret records and and learning how to read them and understand them is so important because those sneaky little notes end up in there as well and i love that there is kind of a version of that for admins to see um for for you know the actual doctor network um and i think that's a great way of a very demurely handling uh physicians that are hurting our community of patients. Um, so I think that's that's a great way to handle it. Thank you. Um, I, I think this is a great takeaway for physicians who are trying to break the cycle, but are struggling to find ways to contribute and do that. Um, one topic we devoted an entire chapter to was pain management and being a pain patient as a woman in America. Now, as a pain patient myself, I've had a long journey of trying to find the balance between getting enough relief to control my pain and being present enough mm -hmm. in my life that I don't feel over medicated. Dr. Patel, you had a great way of describing what women in America can expect out of modern day pain relief. Can you tell us what you mean when you talk about pain being a scream or a whisper? So in the in the pain management office there are a lot of stigma that can be that can persist and one of them is actually calling it's interesting that you said that as well but calling somebody a pain patient right because you're a patient with pain but you know you have many other sort of characteristics outside of that and i think that pain patient stigma perpetuates amongst so many different disciplines um, and I remind, I'm, an, I, uh, I'm a, in an academic institution and I teach and I remind all of my residents, fellows, medical students that 
these are not challenging patients. These are not pain patients. They are patients with challenging pathologies. They are patients with pain. And once you start painting them in that way and not just, you know, this is just a difficult patient sort of thing. There's no such thing in my head, in my mind as a difficult pain, patient or a challenging patient. So that's kind of like the baseline I kind of set it at. And wow, I really internalized that because <laughs> that's definitely how I refer to myself. So thank you for that. that and I've, for me. And I'm sure before before electronic medical records, I'm sure some of this was perpetuated in the history, right? In terms of this is a difficult patient that presents with so-and-so drug seeking, all of these terms, right? So either way, kind of going back to how I, I'm a big believer of education is power, education is knowledge. I believe in educating my patients on what I'm doing, why I'm doing it. And I'm not just here talking to them and they're a recipient of my of the healthcare. They're actually a collaborator, like you said, and we're gonna make this decision together. It's not just this is what we're gonna do and this is how it's gonna go sort of thing. But one of the analogies I use, and I use a lot of analogies in my patient interactions is if the pain at its worst is like a megaphone in your ear. So that's a 10 out of 10 where it consumes you and you can't do anything beyond that. So if I had a megaphone in my ear right now, which sometimes I do, my kids are like screaming into my ears. I can't even listen or do anything around me because that pain is so consuming, right? My job with the tools that I have in a conventional healthcare system and with the resources that the patient may have and, you know, other sort of opportunities as well is to turn that volume down as much as possible. And that's what I tell the patients. As much as I personally would love to make their pain a zero out of 10 and promise them that that's it, you've come to me, no more pain. I know that that's not reality. And to coach them into understanding that the pain dial will be turned down gradually with all of the different resources that we that we have at our, at our disposal with the physician and the patient. So things like, you know, physical therapy, medications, injections, whatever it may be, but turning the volume down as much as possible. And I ask patients, what's your goal? Like, what do you want to achieve? I want to be able to dance with my wife. I want to be able to go, you know, sit in a theater with my children. So those are the goals that we kind of work for. And what level do you think you can do that at? Oh, if I was a four out of 10 or a five out of 10, that's what feels comfortable. So I give them goals that they know. It's not just getting them to a two out of 10 or a zero out of 10 sort of thing. And then I tell them realistically, even if you can't put something to it right now, if you had a whisper in the back of the room or a nagging person in the back of the room where you kind of know that they're there, but you're still able to just work past it and do what you got to do. That's the analogy I kind of give them. So they understand that the pain may not completely go away. And I wish I could take it all away, but there are many different reasons that pain can happen. So being able to create those realistic sort of analogies and then work with them to achieve that. I think that's, oh, it's such like a hard hitting thing for me. Um, the the fact that you coach your patients, I think that's a really important word to use because as someone who I started in pain management at the worst possible time, I'm in America. Um, and as a, as a very young woman, um, probably I was 19 or 20 years old when I saw my first neurologist that kind of led into pain management. And when I tell you there was no coaching, there was no questions. There was no, it was a, what do you want? Okay. Throw some pills at you. And if I come back and you know, they didn't work. It was almost like punishment. It was almost like it was my fault that they didn't work or, you know, I didn't do it correctly or I, you know, I should have communicated better, worse, more or less. It just was a very confusing place to be in and to also be in excruciating pain at the same time. And the way that it unfolded for me, unfortunately, was, you know, I floated from, from one pain management practice into another and I started to realize that one, I was being treated like a criminal. Like I was being treated like I was doing something wrong by being here. I was too young to be here. I was too pretty to be here. I don't mean that egotistically. I mean, like they expected you to be just the worst possible version of yourself when the reality is that so many pain patients, we live like this. This is how we live. Like we have to do things through pain. We are taught, we are trained to, to live in pain. So this is what we look like. We can look like we're having a completely normal day, a very functional day. And that's not the reality. Um, but a lot of patients who go through pain management feel as if they're being 
punished. They're being scrutinized. They get to a place where they're like, okay, I better start hoarding my medication because anyone can cut me from a practice at any time. Um, and it is a very scary place to be in. And as someone who is now in their mid thirties, um, even recently, I, I moved to a new place. I had a new pain doctor and he treated me like a pain doctor that I had in my my early 20s when it was really at the worst kind of relationship that I had. And it was terrifying. It was absolutely soul crushing. I would bring my husband with me because I was scared of him. He threatened to kick me out of the practice multiple times. I hadn't really done anything wrong. But um, anyway, I was able to switch to another physician and he collaborates with me. He talks to me about what's going on in my life. He exactly what you said. What are the goals? What are you trying to do to, you know, be in just enough? You know, we, we understand that we, we are facing an opioid crisis and we don't want to, you know, make you so dependent, but like, let's, it was almost like a place where I could, I could be open to adding in more things because at other practices it had been, well, if you go to physical therapy and I write for physical therapy, I'm not going to give you pain pills. And I was like, well, what, that, what is, what you know and that's it's it's very it was a very bizarre power imbalance trippy kind of thing but to to finally understand what pain management was supposed to be like and to finally be with a doctor who was offering you know pain management uh pharmaceutical pain management physical therapy um had a psychologist on their staff that specialized in in pain and gave classes on what pain does to your body I wish that was the most accessible thing for every person, but to at least know that there's a difference between a good pain management doctor and a not so good pain management doctor was, I think, the most important thing that we got out of that chapter. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, you shared some really good tips on, you know, um, how to evaluate not just your pain, but the ways in which a pain management doctor should treat it. Um, can you describe some things as a pain patient um, that they should look out for when trying to as a patient with pain, um, that a patient should try to look out for when trying to identify if their pain doctor is helping them towards the right path or maybe leading them down the wrong path. Sorry. So if kind of looking at the, at the holistic sort of picture, right? So is this somebody that is actually listening? And I don't mean just, mm -hmm, uh-huh, uh-huh sort yeah. of thing, right? The, the, the back kind of turned and typing away. So it's like actively listening. Um, are they offering you a, um, a multimodal comprehensive treatment? Or is it, well, we usually do this, and it's a cookie cutter recipe. I hate that. I hate the cookie cutter. Everybody gets this, everybody gets that. Yes, physical therapy 100% should be a part of almost every single probably plan. Yes. But at the same time, some patients may benefit from compound creams in a certain area. Some patients may benefit from a suppository. So either way, just kind of having a comprehensive plan that accounts for many different therapies, including physical therapy, medications, interventions, referrals as needed, rather than just everybody, we just, this is how we do it. Everybody gets an epidural every two weeks. Like that's not an answer in my opinion. Right. So understanding that they're actually listening, that they are giving you a more personalized, tailored sort of approach, evidence based. Absolutely. I agree with that, which is why I try to educate. I have models in my office. I have the, the spine model. I have my pelvic model for male and female anatomy and make sure they're actually having a conversation with you. And you're not just a re recipient of information, but you're actually a, like a student of that information and able to ask questions and engage. And I know in this healthcare system where we have like, Q 15 minute visits, it's hard. But you know, one of the things that I started doing was making resources for patients, just having handouts. So I don't have to write everything down, I can just give it to you and then annotate as we go. So make sure your your doctor is actively engaged in your care and giving you a comprehensive but tailored care to you uh, plan for you. When we were working on that chapter together, um, I remember during your interview, there was something that we talked about where you're like, well, you know, a good, uh, some of the questions that I asked are like, what kind of mattress are you sleeping on? And what kind of shoes are you wearing? And I was like, oh my God, that's all stuff I had to figure out on my own was causing me pain. You know, um, as someone who, who pelvic pain is my main issue, um, not realizing how much your pelvic pain is affected by the insoles of your shoes. 
that was just something that was completely like took me a good 10 years, but I got there and I figured that out. Um, and the mattress as well could be a huge problem. Um, just, just the idea that you will have patients that from the very start of their journey in pain management, who you will tell these things to and coach them and guide them. It makes me want to cry. It just makes me so I have hope and I have relief knowing that that pain patients will pass through your office and get the care that they deserve. So I, I really appreciate you for that. <laughs> so one thing patients always struggle with is the pre-appointment anxiety. Uh, when they're trying to figure out who is this doctor that they're scheduled with, I don't know about you, but I go straight to searching online, trying to get a feel for who they are, what they specialize in, what they wrote on a form 10 years ago, what their character and personality might be like. Um, no, not every doctor wants to have a, po a public social media presence, um, but I'm thrilled when they do. So the way that I was able to connect with both of you for this book was because of your social media presences. And Dr. Cotteria, you are the queen of TikTok. Uh, and if you catch any of her videos, her comment sections are flooded with questions from patients eager to understand different topics from insurance to rare disease. Um, just, just trying to get a little bit more knowledgeable. And Dr. Patel, you have a very successful podcast with your colleague called The Hurt Podcast, which you have to listen to it. If you haven't listened to it, just add it to your Spotify and get the alerts on it because it's amazing. I'd love to know how showing up for patients as a public advocate online has changed your perspective about how to best work with patients in your practice. Um, so how has social media, let's start with you, Dr. Cotteria, how has that impacted the way that you interact with your patients? Um, you know, my perspective on how best to work with patients changed drastically. After reading all the feedback I received online for my videos, watching all the stories people tell of their experience with their doctors, that you know, TikTok is full of patient stories that are quite shocking. Um, and so it's disheartening to not have the ability to provide care and education to patients in this current state of how we deliver healthcare. And I, that's something I really appreciate about your book. You do define that and you explain there are, it's a multifaceted problem. Um, but with that being said, you know, going into social media and interacting with people, teaching, learning from people in return, I have learned so much from TikTok that I did not learn in medical school. And I have expanded my knowledge base to help people who have these conditions that aren't covered in medical school and aren't routinely um, discussed or treated or have approved, approved treatments. Uh, I've learned a lot from TikTok. And so I think what's really been beneficial for me is learning just how valuable of a resource patients are for my own learning. And not only with medical knowledge, but with the patient experience as well. Um, you know, the, being on, on social media has really given me that piece of medicine back that has been cut short by these 20 minute corporate insurance driven medicine delivery systems. It gave me back that physician patient interaction where we get to teach and we get to go back and forth with questions and answers, you know, and so it's, this has impacted me so much that I've decided to transition my entire career to patient advocacy now. And so healthcare has become so complicated that people need a person who can spend time listening, teaching, guiding, and advocating. And that's what I want to do. And that's what social media is teaching me. And it, it's, it's just been a really rewarding experience. And I'm very, very grateful for the people who have been interacting with me on TikTok and Instagram. And, and that is how I met you. And now Dr. Patel, and I've been binge listening to, to your podcast so I think it, it will be very validating for a lot of people. And I just, I'm very, I'm proud of both of you. I appreciate you both. <laughs> proud of you too. I'm really proud of you. And I'm just sentimental here. <laughs> I'm so, I, I love how you talk about even just the focus of, of, of TikTok being that you're learning, not even that you're teaching and you are, you're going out there and you're giving great information, but the fact that you're focused on the fact that you can learn from patients out there yeah. on TikTok, which is like, I mean, that's so incredible. We, we have, we do have so many resources out there. Um, TikTok, I know it's not for everyone. It's for me. I love it. Um, I I doom scroll all day and I and I have a great time. Um, and I have learned so much on it as well. I have connected with so many fantastic people. Um, I feel like it's 
you know, it reminds me a lot of being back in college and just listening to like mini lectures. I love it. Um, yeah. So I thank you, Dr. Patel. What about you? How's the podcast going and how has it changed your perspective on, you know, communication with patients and, and even just the guests that you have on as well? So as a physician, I think it really helped me understand that a lot of our, um, our understanding of medicine is in a vacuum until you have that patient feedback, right? So mm -hmm. um, being on social media, I was able to connect with people, read their comments, and also on TikTok and whatnot, see what other people's experiences are. So yes, I could do a pudendal nerve block 100% exactly the way the book says it, perfect spread. But if the patient doesn't have relief, and they said something different and they want to do something differently, I kind of take that, you know, I take that into consideration. So what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is it's taught me to listen to patients, to understand that there are different people have different experiences and um, have that feedback. So I, I've, it's opened me up to a different perspective and I appreciate that. Uh, and the podcast too, it was a way to learn as a physician that there are different ways to advocate for patients. And the podcast has become an avenue for patients to learn about their conditions. We can't teach everything about pudendal neuralgia in a 15 minute visit, but if you have a 30 minute episode to kind of see the inside the, the, the way that we treat pudendal neuralgia, it's, it makes patients feel better. So it's become a tool for patients to understand their pathology a bit better or a different perspective, um, connect with people. Like you were on the podcast last year for, for medical gaslighting as well. So again, I send patients, patients that, for patients who come to my office and say, I've been going through this for years and I've been, you know, bounced around the healthcare system, I, I direct them to your podcast. So I was like, well, she has a book coming out, but in the meantime, here's the podcast. And these are all the different ways that you can advocate for your care. Um, and as a physician, I think that that's one of the most important things we can do, know our limitations and advocate for patients to get care, even if it's not with us. Yeah. I feel like with either of you, just the trust would be immediate the trust in the relationship would be immediate. And I love that you guys are constantly learning and you're going out there and you're connecting with patients on this level because I really think that's very meaningful work coming from physicians. And I appreciate both of you showing up online, in person, and especially as experts for this book and coming to speak with us tonight. Please make sure to add both of them on social. Um, we, I'm not sure if we can drop their handles in the chat, but if not, they'll be in my Instagram stories after this. And now that I've grilled both of you, it's my turn for the hot seat. So I'll take any questions from the chat now. Let's see. I'm coming on to read them to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So um, we've asked folks, folks to upvote questions. Um, do medical schools utilize a trauma-informed curriculum? Ooh, so this might be a question for both of my um, physicians here, but I do have some thoughts on this. So one of the other experts that I interviewed for this book, Dr. Michelle Flom, she works at Xavier University and she has the first um, full medical trauma curriculum. Like um, <laughs> students can go in and come out with a degree basically in medical trauma um, as therapists and, and discuss like how to handle that um, and treat that specifically. So we also have a full um, chapter in the book just on medical trauma, um, how patients can kind of recover from that and it being such a unique experience outside of other kind of traumas and other kind of relational experiences. Um, so we do cover that a lot in the book and I'm, uh, I'm really excited to see what people think about that chapter and, and if they find those resources useful. Awesome. Um, how do I join you on this healthcare advocacy? Uh, as a social worker, I would love to join. Oof. Um, glad to have you. <laughs> well, I think for, for me, I, um, right now I am, this is it. This is my main form of advocacy. I'm an educator on social media. I'm an author and that's kind of how I'm contributing anything that I can do to um, spread advocacy through media is what I'm focusing on right now. And I think that that's a really open space. And I'm always looking for opportunities to talk about this, panels to be on, places to be, articles to write. Um, and it's something I would absolutely encourage anybody else who has an interest in this space in doing. Um, 
as you saw, we just talked about social media and podcasts and whatever forum kind of feels right for you to talk about your knowledge and expertise in that. Um, so I don't know, I guess I definitely connect with me on Instagram because I'm always looking for people who are, who are interested in working in this space and seeing how we can collaborate together. So before we go, we'll make sure that all three of y'all's Instagram handles or TikTok handles are in the chat. So um, we can be sure to drop those so folks can follow you. Um, how can we as patients gain access to our medical records, especially as they become more centralized on digital platforms? Oh, this is an interesting question. So we did do a whole chapter on um, medical records, electronic medical records. So the first thing to know is that it is your legal right to uh to possess and own and read your medical records and no doctor legally can keep them from you you should um, always be able to access if not an online portal which the majority of doctors are currently using it's they, they usually i mean the majority of doctors are using my chart but some are other some are using other smaller portals and i imagine with the conversations that i've had that they will all be centralized probably to an epic system which is my chart within the next couple of years but if not and if your doctor is from the stone age and they are only using paper files uh they they are legally owed to you so you may have to pay um uh, a printing fee but um they do have to give them to you uh in the book there is a whole kind of listing of the legalities of it and if your doctor argues with you how to launch a complaint to make sure that you get those records because they are yours yeah do, do they put any you know you're talking about sort of the side notes of like this is a difficult patient or this is a you know a drug seeking patient does that stuff show up in my chart or is there a secret place where they're putting the derogatory stuff about all of us another really good question um so i believe that what you see is what you get so what what shows up in the so there's a clinical summary and there's the notes section right if you go on like basically any pa patient portal it has that so the clinical summary is like everything like oh your height weight the basic problem you came in today what medications you're on your allergies and all that and that's viewable to everyone and the notes is exactly the entire appointment what you went over what the goal was, what the problem was, what they prescribed. And what you see is what the other doctors should see um, because all those networks are becoming connected. Um, so technically I don't think there's a hidden section and I don't know if it's, I don't know guys, like do you, <laughs> Dr. Patel and Dr. Cotteria, do you know of any secret, like, is there a way that they do that? Is there? We'll bring them back. So, so, that we can... <laughs> so yeah. you know, the, um, I'm just going to talk broadly about like Epic because that's the most common and the widely used yeah. system that is in all the big uh, academic centers across the country. Um, for the most part, everything everything is recorded. There's always a way to access that information. If you really wanted to to retrieve your records, um, you know how when you fill out the request, you can put I just want soap notes or I just want labs, I just want imaging, um, but you can request everything. And, and if you are in the middle of a lawsuit, doctors can summons this stuff and get all of those little nooks and crannies where we stuff information that aren't readily visible in the medical record. Um, Epic does have an FYI portion that is only visible usually to the, the doctor and nobody else. Um, so there are things that are documented in the chart that aren't as visible to the patient as you would think. So um, yes, there are things in there that you may not see. Um, and so it's, I think it's actually a big problem. I, it, there are things that are documented against people and, and it's really harmful. Some of it is, is very, very harmful, but yes, there, there is stuff in there that, that can't be seen by the patient. That's interesting. That's good to know. Yeah. Unless you summon the records. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we'll keep you all up here because, you know, you yeah. may have something to, to add Sorry. in. So our next question is, how do we address the other side of this, which is insurance companies declining meds or limiting billing so docs aren't able to spend more than 15 minutes with a patient? Oh, and I might defer this one, too, because, well, certainly for this book, I'm covering medical gaslighting as the main topic. But this is, just as a patient advocate, a major issue that we deal with. And I know that you, Dr. Cotteria, you have a lot of experience with this because you used to do the admin side of this. You have any any advice for this part? 
This is tough because um, insurance, there are there are hundreds of thousands of policies and we don't have a good way of looking up what's covered or not. You know, if if I have 10 patients with Blue Cross, they have 10 different policies. There's no way for me to look it up. And so we get trapped in this pull and push between insurance and patient and we're right in the middle of this fight. Um, it's tough. This is actually one of the biggest problems we have in medicine right now now is that we're being we're our time with our patients are being taken away and we're being forced to do so much in such a short period of time and so we can't cover the topics and the information we need to justify covering the meds and get the documentation done so it's it's a huge problem um one thing that would help on the patient side is mm -hmm. to have a way to sign into your insurance like every insurance has an app or a way you can readily look up your coverage. And if you're in your doctor's office, you can get ahead a lot of this stuff. It does take a little bit of extra work, but if you can get your username and password and, and sign into your explanation of benefits, you can kind of see what's covered for the particular problem and bring it up at the visit rather than waiting until we're fighting with the pharmacy, fighting with the insurance. So it's that's, that's one way, but really this is a big, big problem in healthcare. It is. And it's something that, um, that, I mean, as a, as a patient myself, I've spent a lot of time just being the one on the phone and being the one just going through. And I've done it before appointments. If I have an idea of what the problem is, I'm looking up the medications, I'm calling my insurance company. I'm like, what do you actually cover before I go in there? So that I know, which is, it's hard for a lot of patients because normally you may not know what they're going to prescribe, but if you, if you do, if you have an idea of calling your insurance before you go in is, is helpful. And then getting on the phone with them even afterwards is also helpful. And they do sometimes have a search too, where you can search the medication. And if it's not covered, they might give you an alternative. Um, and then you can ask your doctor, will this still work for me? Cause this is the one that's covered. You know, you can, you can get ahead of some of these things like that. Yeah. Especially for biologics and for the, the new GLP ones, those I, I know that like Blue Cross Blue Shield has a whole database. They're like, as soon as you get on the phone with them, like, just go to this page, put in, put in the type you have, and it will give you the list of exactly what is covered and what is not covered. So yeah. they're, they're annoyed with all of us calling. So they finally are creating resources. We appreciate it. So. <laughs> um, as a pediatrician myself, who has recently experienced horrific gaslighting over poorly understood diseases I have, do y'all have advice on how I can make part of my career patient advocacy? I think I might, this is, this is for you guys as well. I mean, for, I will say that for regular patients, um, I work for a company called health union and we've just created the patient leader certification program, which takes you through all different types of patient advocacy, um, legislative advocacy, speaking, social media, all that kind of stuff. If you have an interest in just developing those skills as a patient advocate and going out in the world and, and making that part of your mission in your career, um, I can send you that link if you hit me up on Instagram. Um, but as far as you guys, that's probably not the easiest thing incorporating advocacy into your, but you've both done it and you've done it beautifully. One of the ways that I started is you, we don't have to like reinvent the wheel, so to speak, sort of thing, but, um, just having those resources and education, just pre, um, creating, pre-printed sort of sheets and giving it to them at their visit, um, having models and education. And I know, again, at 15 minute visits, it's hard to really do this. And my visits tend to be a little bit longer. So I do have that time. Uh, but one of the ways I tell my residents and fellows is even if you don't know the answer, there are three things you can do with them. So a lot of multi multidisciplinary comprehensive care is about lifestyle modifications, identifying pain triggers and all of that. So just like you said, you didn't know to look or think about your shoes or the bed or whatever. We as physicians, if I know that leg length discrepancy might be contributing to SI joint pain, one of the things I can tell patients is, okay, let me help you figure this out. So coaching, counseling, and care coordination is how I break it down to residents. So you can coach a patient in terms of, okay, why can't you go to the pool? What could we do? Like find, helping them eliminate barriers and whatnot. You can counsel patients in terms of, this is what you need to do in terms of, you know, taking your medications or suppositories or whatever, or, you know, medic um, injections and then co care coordination. So oftentimes with patients, even if we can't do coaching or counseling because it's out of our area, mm -hmm. I volunteer 
to coordinate care for them. Tell me who you need to see. I will send an email. I will send a message. I will help you get in touch with that person, advocate for you, communicate on, you know, on your behalf to another physician who will hopefully take you earlier or sooner or more seriously in terms of symptoms, because how many patients are gaslit and told that, you know, it's not, it's not pain sort of thing. So then I tell them as a pain physician, I've evaluated them and I'm going to help coordinate their care to get, you know, you, your opinion. I love that. And I think if that's something that people have the time, you know, physicians have the time to provide, that's excellent. But even just you saying like you provide like printouts, I would be thrilled with a printout. <laughs> I know the threshold is kind of low, but like, I really, I really do feel like, oh, you took the time, you care, like you have an understanding of what the problem is. And we both know that we can't sit here for three hours, but giving me something to go home with is better than not giving me anything or just, you know, vaguely kind of like leaving me to figure it out on my own. So I think, I think even that really does make a difference for a lot of patients who experience gaslighting. Um, we're coming up on the end of the, of our time, but I do just want to um, lift up one last question. All these questions are great. I'm sorry we can't get to all of them, but I know a lot of people also want to go watch the vice presidential debate. So um, <laughs> we want, we want to give you time to go do that. But um, I think this question is important and I hear this from a lot of folks. So I'm going to just summarize it. This person is saying that they were diagnosed with lupus, which is an autoimmune disease. Um, and they have been 15 years sober from hard drugs, but they did contract hepatitis C, um, mm. though they have since been treated and have no viral load. They never know how honest to be about their past or when in the conversation with doctors to talk about their history. Their my chart presumably tells the provider about the history of hep C, but they don't know if they read it or care. And so it feels sensitive to bring it up. They want to be honest and open about their history um, with someone that they're trusting with their life. But in their experience, it just leads to more bias and medical gaslighting. What is your advice to controversial but relevant histories and how to best share that with new providers? I think I can start with this one. Um, so that that's something we do talk about a little bit is about, you know, presenting yourself as a patient and kind of building that relationship with the doctor. And that no doubt is a extremely hard situation to be in, especially if you're looking for lupus is a painful condition. So if you're looking for help with pain or even symptoms that, you know, are, are similar at all to going through addiction and recovery. Um, and a lot of it is, is the matter of finding that doctor that is a good fit for you because that unconscious and implicit bias is, it's tough to overcome and it's easy to spot. So a lot of what the book teaches is, you know, is this, is this a room that I should be in or do I leave this room? Is there nothing for me in this room? And we talk a lot about, you know, like what are the warning signs that a doctor is, it's not, they're not going to help me, you know, and that's something that patients really need the skill to, to quickly figure out, like, is this doctor the right doctor for me? Um, and a lot of us stay in, you know, in practices that are not the right practices for us that are harming not just our health, but our mental health, um, especially if you're you're in recovery, that is so, you know, extremely difficult to, um, to move forward with, and you should be so proud of yourself, and you should not have a doctor who tears you down for that. Um, so hopefully, this book will help you kind of figure out, you know, is this doctor giving off signs and you know, um, the language that they're using, is it going to have such a bias against me that we're not going to make any, you know, any room here for me getting better. Um, so hopefully in those, um, in those chapters, um, the strategies that we have laid out will help to narrow down if that, that is the right room for you, or if it's time to leave and go to someone else. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate all of your answers and engagement and all of your work and activism. Um, and thanks to everyone in the chat. I, I think so many of y'all are clearly activists in your own right, um, probably because you're forced to be as um, healthcare consumers. But um, I'm glad that you're here and I'm glad that you found this book. I want to encourage folks um, to buy the book. Uh, you can click the teal button at the bottom center of the screen to buy the book from Karis. It really does help us when you buy event books from us. We also really encourage you to encourage your local public library to carry this book. 
it's a great way to do just a little bit to help other people. So if you can afford to buy a book, that's great. But it also really matters that there are a lot of people out there who can't afford to buy a book and they need this information too. So encourage college libraries to carry it, but really encourage your public library to have it. Um, I'm going to repackage this and put this up on Karis's YouTube channel uh, probably sometime tomorrow. So that um, URL is youtube.com backslash Karis Circle. And so if there's folks who you know would really benefit from this conversation, let them know about this. Share this URL um, so that more people can, can know about this great book and know about the concept of medical gaslighting if that's not something they've ever heard before, but maybe have experienced. We want to get this information out to them. So um, real quick, why don't y'all shout out each of your, um, the best ways for folks to follow you, um, sort of your preferred channels, uh, or handles so that everyone can be sure to follow you there too. Thanks. Yeah. I'm, um, at Alana underscore Jacqueline on Instagram, TikTok, um, and just at Alana Jacqueline mm -hmm. on X. If you use X, I don't use it that much though. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yes, I'm pretty easy to find. My social media handles are all follow up PCP, follow up underscore PCP. My advocacy website is called primaryadvocacy.com if you're interested in seeing what we're offering. Um, but all of my socials follow up PCP. Great. All of my socials are Alovi Patel uh, MD. So Alovi Patel MD, all one. And um, my website is www.alovipatel.com. So thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for your important work. I hope that you stay safe and well and um, that your your advocacy continues to make a difference in the lives of patients and doctors because we, we all need this. So congratulations on your book birthday, Alana, and I hope it continues to be a great success. Thank you so much. Have a great night.